How do we know that dinosaurs are millions of years old? Welcome to the Natural History of Dinosaurs. My name is Benjamin Berger. I'm a paleontologist teaching at Utah State University in the heart of Utah's dinosaur country in Vernal. In this video, I'll briefly outline how geologists determine the age of a rock layer using radioactive isotopes. First, let's look at how we know the age of anything. I mean, how do you know how old you are? Time is a measurement of change, which means that we need some change or a series of events to define a person's age, such as the number of times the Earth has circled the sun, representing a year, or the number of times the Earth has spun around, representing a day. We can count these and get an age. But how do we know something is old and something is young? Well, we simply age and get older with the events in our lives. Now, it's easy to see the difference between an old person, such as my grandma at the age of 70, and when she was five years old, because she lived through a series of events as she got older. And the same is true of fossils and rocks. They, too, change with age. In this video, we'll look at how we can date dinosaur fossils by the layers of rocks that they are found in. In this video, we'll determine the absolute date, or the more precise date, measured in the unit of years. For example, stating that a dinosaur fossil is 100 million years old. First, we need a measuring tool. And I have one here that we can use. This is an hourglass, but I've made some modifications so that it can, instead of being representing an hour, it actually takes 1,000 million years to drop all the sand from the top of the glass to the bottom. This is a geologic glass. Oh my gosh, this video is going to be long. Now this is what we're going to need if we're going to measure the age of a dinosaur. If we used a, a simple hourglass, all the sand would pour out in such a short amount of time that it would be worthless. All right, first let's define some terms. We'll call the sand at the top of the hourglass the parent sand. And at time zero, when we first turn over the, hour, the geologic glass here, all the sand will be parent sand. The sand, which will fall to the bottom, we'll call the daughter sand. And at time zero, There'll be no sand at the bottom of the glass. Now, let's imagine that we start letting the sand pour out of the top of this geological glass. Even after 100 years, we'll see very little sand at the bottom of the glass. So it'd be difficult to measure, say, the passing of a single year using this geological glass. Now let's speed up time. Over the millions of years, the parent sand falls ever slowly down, becoming daughter sand. If we measure the amount of parent sand, we notice that it's decreasing, and the amount of daughter sand will increase. After about 500 million years, we'll reach about the equal amounts of parent and daughter sand. We call this unit of time the half-life, because half, 50% of the sand, has fallen. Now, determining the age around the half-life is much easier, as we have lots of parent and daughter sand to measure. After 1,000 million years, all the sand has emptied from the top of the glass, and we no longer use the glass to date anything, as dates longer than this are impossible to determine because there's only daughter sand in our geologic glass. Shows what's called a linear decay of sand, from the parent state at the top of the glass to the daughter state at the bottom of the glass. The percentage of parent sand decreases while the daughter sand increases. Now let's use a different tool. Let's use microwave popcorn, which has two states as well. We have the parent state, which is the unpopped kernels, 
and the popped popcorn that you eat, which is the daughter state. Now microwave popcorn differs from our geologic glass in that each kernel has equal probability of popping as it is heated in the microwave. So as time moves, the chance of a kernel popping increases. Now let's do the same graph. Here we've measured the amount of parent kernels to daughter popcorn. Now as we let the microwave cook, the kernels start to pop until half of the kernels are popcorn and half of the kernels are still kernels. This is the half-life, but you notice that this graph looks different. This is an exponential decay graph since each kernel has the same probability of popping. This is not like the linear decay we observed with the hourglass in which only the sand near the opening would drop. Now we could use this technique this time to count the number of kernels and compare to the number of popcorn in a bag of popcorn, microwave popcorn, to determine how long the bag was cooked. This is the same way that we're using our geological hourglass. We just need to measure the amount of parent and daughter states. Now note that in the case of the microwave popcorn, there's always going to be a few kernels in your bag, and that's because they decay using the exponential curve. Each half-life, say one minute in the microwave oven, half of the kernels pop. The next minute in the microwave, half of those remaining kernels pop. So we then have 75% popcorn, and the, if we wait another minute, Half of the remaining 25% of the kernels will pop, so then we'll have 87.5% popcorn. With the next minute, that will leave us with 93.75% popcorn. And about this time, we start worrying that we're going to start burning our popcorn. And we'll continue to be halved and halved until no kernels are left unpopped. So this is how exponential decay works the amount of kernels will decrease by half with each half-life. Now we can apply this to determining the age of a rock. In particular, a rock that has a distinct start time, one that was molten liquid and has cooled into a solid rock. Yep, we can only date igneous rocks, but igneous rocks are often found in relationship to dinosaur fossils. In particular, volcanic ash that's fallen out of the sky and was laid down into the sedimentary rocks where we can find dinosaur bones. So we can't directly date a fossil bone, but we can date the rig rocks that are associated with the fossil. So this volcanic ash, once it becomes a solid rock, starts our geologic clock ticking with zero dollars daughter states. Now what's happening inside the rock is that radioactive isotopes start to decay, like kernels of popcorn popping. Isotopes are atoms with the same number of protons and neutrons. Elements are atoms with the same number of protons, but they can have different numbers of neutrons. Some isotopes are radioactive and decay over a period of time at a regular rate. One of the classic radioactive isotopes is potassium-40, which decays to a gas, the isotope argon-40, by losing a proton and electron to form a neutron. Now, as a gas, argon-40, we know that the rock, when it was a liquid, didn't contain any of this gas, as it would bubble out before it formed into a solid rock. However, any gas that's trapped inside the rock of this argon-40 formed after it cooled into a rock from the decay of potassium-40. Hence, all we need to do is just measure the amount of argon inside the rock to determine how old the rock is. Scientists use a tool called a mass spectrometer to measure the amount of different isotopes inside a rock based on their different atomic mass. Now, Using the ratio then of potassium-40 to argon-40 isotopes in a rock, scientists can then determine the age of the rocks 
near that half-life, which in the case of argon-40 and potassium-40 is 1,248 million years old. So potassium-argon ratios have been measured from thousands of igneous rocks associated with dinosaur fossils. And geologists have determined the dinosaurs lived from about 235 to 66 million years ago. All right, so if you know that there is 50% potassium-40 and 50% argon-40, the rock is, has a half-life of 1,248 million years, then it is 1,248 million years old. If the ratio instead is 75% potassium-40 and 25% argon-40, then the rock is going to be half of the half-life, which is 624 million years. If the rock has 25% potassium-40 and 75% argon-40, then the rock is twice the half-life, or 2,496 million years old. All right, now you should be able to compute the absolute date if given the ratio of parent and daughter products of radioactive decay and given the half-life of an isotope.